think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Maddie Rupert, and I am an honors student here at Chesapeake College. And on behalf of the Honors Council, the Division of Arts and Sciences, and Chesapeake College, I welcome you to the Fall 2016 British Debate. Our topic today involves the preference of living in a state or country where major media outlets would be balanced and objective, rather than outlets that represent different political and world agendas. This topic could not be more relevant here in the United States than it is at this moment, with the 2016 presidential election occurring just a week ago. As I'm sure we are all aware, this election has sparked controversy between friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, and so on. And according to various news outlets, several riots have occurred. With that in mind, the question arises as to how much the media has influenced the general public's view and perception of this election and of news in general. So to debate this topic today, we are privileged to have with us the award-winning members of the National British Debate Team. Please welcome David Jones and James Barras. <laughs> David, who is directly to my left here, has a great deal of experience in the coaching of debate and public speaking, having provided training and development to both C-level executives and inner city school children. He started debating whilst at University in Wales after mixing up the rooms for the Ultimate Frisbee Club, and he was hooked from there on in. He has won seven competitions, including the John Smith Memorial Mace and his final and almost 50 others. Recently, he has looked to other avenues to develop his public speaking skills further, having taken up both Toastmasters and winning several stand-up comedy awards. Professionally, debating is a big part of his everyday life as a management consultant, where he regularly has to brief and debate on strategic issues referring to the telecoms market. Recently, he made televised appearances on the BT Speaks debate show and in front of the House of Commons Select Committee hearings. Welcome, David. James is a physics graduate from Warwick who got sucked into the black hole of debating in first year and never looked back. James has been an active member of the Warwick Society for four years. He has participated in public debates, helped run competitions, and competed as Warwick A at EUDC 2016. James has spoken and judged at numerous BP competitions and is a breaking speaker at the York IV, Sheffield IV, KCL IV, Sci-Fi Open, and winner of the Warwick Ironman Internal. When not debating, James has taken up writing as science and technology editor at The Globalist, as well as being publicity officer for the student-ran Warwick Think Tank. He's currently caught between reading about Rawlsian theories of justice and quantum computing. Welcome, James. <clears throat> the format for the debate will be as follows. There will be one seven-minute speech from each side, starting with David, and it will be followed by a second seven-minute speech from each side. During these speeches, debaters are allowed to interrupt one another for points of information. Opening speeches will be followed by a 10-minute session for audience questions, and following your questions, each side will offer a five-minute closing speech. After the closing speech, I will ask you to stand and vote for who you thought was the winner of today's debate. So we are going to start off with David. Hey everyone, how's, it, how's everyone doing? Uh, good, good. Uh, I'm going to start this debate by saying just what an important topic it is to be debating today. Because we've just had a spoiled, petulant child in a place where he didn't belong ruin the life of one of America's greatest public servants. But enough about Harambe, we should probably talk about the debate. <laughs> eh, that's a good enough level of laughs. I just, want to say, I just want to say thank you for everyone who's had us, who's welcomed us. You've all been absolutely lovely. We're really grateful to be here. Both myself and Jamie aren't going to debate the point on how nice it is to be in Maryland. And it's so nice because coming out here, one of the things I was really worried about was clowns. <laughs> and we've seen a lot about, we heard a lot about the damaging impact of clowns. And whilst we're out here, we haven't seen any. But actually, we've seen one, but he's now your president, so... <laughs> Really though, 
it, it's really nice to be in the US at a time like this because we've just gone through a horrendous separation, something you may know as Brexit, Britain leaving the EU, and it was a campaign of racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and violence. And we're so glad to be out here where you guys have none of this. <laughs> so I'm going to actually start the debate now and stop the welcomes. Uh, so what is this debate really about? The debate is about what the aim of the media should be. Should it be an aim to be balanced and unbiased? Or should you have a wide range of views, from Breitbart to Das Kapital, allowing for choice within the population? We're going to say that in some times, in some situations, choice is not always what you want in a scenario. Imagine you have a choice between a basket full of apples and all of them are mouldy and have maggots in. Or on the other hand, you just have one apple, but that apple has been guaranteed to be free of maggots, that apple is clean, that apple is fresh. We say that you want a society where you know that everything you're getting, everything you're given, is given that stamp of being clean and fresh. And in this scenario, that's our case of having one really strong news source that is attempting to be the unbiased point. So what is, the, what is it that I support? A strong single media presence with no ownership by exterior or organisations, being continually vetted for factual accuracy and having to give retractions the same prominence as the falsehoods if they produce any. I think the key difference to point out here in this debate is that it is the ownership structure and motivation that differs between my case and Jamie's case here. Because Jamie's case is for a plurality of views, and on that plurality of views, it comes with each individual political ideology which sets it down from the top. The motivation for an ideal media source is one that is separate from the government, but separate from political organisations and separate from political ideology. Because we say that when you have someone dictating what is and what isn't allowed to be said at the top, say, Rupert Murdoch, Fox News, or now Jeff Bezos with the Washington Post, then it pushes an agenda, and that agenda takes primacy over the factual accuracy of the particular viewpoint. At this point, it's probably worth pointing out that 64% of Fox News viewers still believe that Barack Obama was born in Kenya. There's no incentive for Fox News to promote an alternative viewpoint under the um, scenario that Jamie supports. No, thank you. Because... <laughs> Because it is one in which they understand that the political ideology set at the top means that each and every one of their jobs is dependent on sticking to that party line. If the line is the top level ownership, that factual accuracy is the thing you should be promoting and factual accuracy is the ultimate guiding strategy, then you don't have that problem of misinformation being spread. So it's important to note, no thank you, that all choices carry bias. And this debate is about the prominence of those biases and what the aims and the checks are inside of things. So at this point, many of you may not have heard of a guy named Reince Pribus, who has just been appointed the chief strategist for Trump and Trump's governance. And he wrote in one of his articles for Breitbart saying that this is just another part of the Jewish scum that control our media. No US news at the moment has covered this history for arrests for racial violence, but because we say there exists a different news source, BB, uh, in our case the BBC, which is one we stand by and support, which has an ideology which is about maximising the truth that is involved in our political discourse, the BBC has carried that story, has talked about his history for racial violence and his history for being a racist bigot. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is two things. One, which choice, which scenario leads to the most misinformation? And two, what does this do to society? So the first point to note is that Jamie's going to talk about competition and having a multitude of sources leads to a large amount of competition for factual accuracy. And we think that what this actually does is it drives towards sensationalism. Because as you stick to a political ideology, you continually have to validate your own political belief that you're putting out there. And in order to do that, you have to sensationalise in order to sell. So the way they do this and the way you see this working in the status quo is that they sensationalise to the extreme. So Fox News will take the Black Lives Matter protests and will focus solely on the violence that comes from a few small Black Lives Matter protesters. MSNBC will do the opposite and ignore the myriad of good police interactions that occurred and focus on the sm few small negative ones. And they do this both because they have a need to continually defend their political ideology that supports them as the legitimate one. If the ideology that supports you is the one that is a fact-based one, then you can run the case that 99% of interactions between police and Black Lives Matter protesters has been non-violent. You can say that these individuals do not deserve to be shot, that 
is not an unbiased that is not an unbiased statement but you can also talk about the interactions between them and why is this bad so it's bad for a couple of reasons the first is it drives division within politics one of the big parts that i uh, i was reading when coming over here is that an american population has a massive disparate view on its own personal opinion versus the the view of the rest of the country and the health of the rest of the country only 37% of people in the US think the US is heading in a good direction at the moment. This is one of the lowest parts it has ever been historically. But 67% of American people say that life is at their best point ever. And what this has happened is that the sensationalism that exists within a disparate news system has driven people to believe that their own lives are good but everything else around them is turning into this quagmire of shite. And that is because there is a need for the sensationalism to drive the sales and that is the only source of media that these people get. More importantly, we say there are more falsehoods under a system in which is which has a massive disparate view of uh, what can be said. Firstly, we say there are more falsehoods because it can be corporate captured. It can be owned by sources with bias and stop stories getting out. So you say Fox News have repeatedly stopped criticism of the Fox News uh, the Fox network and uh, criticism of Rupert Murdoch. And when that is your only source of information, as it is for a large number of Americans, you forget about some of the travesties that they have committed. The majority here, but Jamie might say, but you can get it from another source. Someone else is going to criticize Fox News for doing that. But the majority of humanity, not you guys, you guys are the clever ones, but the majority of humanity don't have the ability to weigh falsehoods against each other. Because the weighing of competing structures of reality, one in which saying is Fox News is really good, and one in which is saying Fox News is bad, requires you to have a background knowledge of each and every statement they make. So without a significant background in, say, I don't know, environmental politics, it is hard for an individual to determine whether global warming is or isn't a fact. If someone is having to choose between two competing realities and chooses either between global warming is a fact and global warming isn't, then they can't have, they often don't have the background knowledge to make the distinctions between the two. So in terms of a system which relies on a large view of disparate opinions all checking on each other, it falls down at the first hurdle because it requires everybody in that society to have a massive amount of background knowledge in pretty much every topic available. So is that thing six or seven minutes? Yeah, that, that's it. Okay, fine. The last part that is, I've just got to quickly talk about is progressional opposition. Because individuals often don't just define themselves by who they are, but by who they aren't. And we say that the biggest example of this is in Northern Ireland, where there was a combative media, and people define themselves not just by their media presence, but who they listen to. So the Catholics, we used to listen to the Catholic press, and uh, the Northern Irish Protestants used to listen to a newspaper called Black and Tan. And one of the things that happened is that the disparate takes on press made people define themselves in opposition to the other people's press news. And it meant that the society itself became more polarized and increased the number of attacks between the two groups of people. What happened as one of the processes of the Good Friday Agreements was we changed the way society inter uh, interacts and promoted a, a less biased media source and we gave the BBC a level of national prominence in Northern Ireland that it didn't have previously. What this has done is this has significantly changed the ideologies of both the hardline Catholic and Protestant factions within Northern Ireland and significantly reduced the levels of violence that exists there. So if Jamie wants to get up here and talk about the polarising effects and how you can have this kind of narrative of change while still existing within that framework work, then often you don't. Often you do just get people choosing their own particular media source and then choosing to ignore or deliberately attacking the other groups involved within that society. We think a strong central media presence which says things, these are the facts and this is the government structure in which I have to operate, is one in which is much better for the United States, one in which is much better for the world, and one in which is much better for peace. With that, I beg you to propose this motion. Thank you.
Okay, one thing in this direct response to what David has said. So he talks about the importance of having a neutral media, of media that has ownership but is not tied to particular political interests of this or, the, of this or that other kind. We say that the existence of media that is run by Rupert Murdoch, Sky News, Fox News, does not mean that you can't also have organisations like the BBC exist. We don't think these things are mutually exclusive. In fact, we think that each news agency um, in a world of plurality tends to call each other out for their factual inaccuracies. And that is something that means that people strive to compete on factual accuracy, or at least strive to avoid the most egregious errors of factual accuracy, because they know they'll get called out by the other sources, and they know they want to be the victors in that debate by having the more high ground of always winning those debates. But that's... That's not one, what's important, because this is not a debate about facts. This is a debate about politics. In order to understand this debate, the question that you need to answer is, why is being informed important? Because it's not important for the sake of it in and of itself. Right? It's not useful that I know like, the details of like, the Japanese Defence Force military spending just because I know it. Right? Like, that's not useful in and of itself. It's useful because information is needed to inform opinions and to decide on what aspects of the world are good or are bad. It is needed so that you form opinions and then that you take action, so that you vote or you write or you speak or you protest, right? What we say is that a neutral media fails to facilitate these essential aspects of democracy. Why? The reason, to understand the reason why, you have to ask what neutral media really looks like, right? Because what neutral media means is ignoring opinion. It means ignoring evaluation and focusing purely on the facts. A neutral media means that when you turn on your television set, when you pick up your newspaper, you are bombarded with lists of events, of people, of numbers, of it here has gone up, that there it's gone down. This was happening, that was happening. These are the lists of all of the people in this cabinet in the US, all of the people in this cabinet in France, in England, in Germany. It overwhelms you. It's a purely descriptive view of the world, which is a torrent of information that as an individual is incredibly difficult to grasp, right? Normal people's lives don't allow for you to pick apart that information, to evaluate that information, and apply your own views on the world to each of those bits of information, piece by piece by piece. David already acknowledges this, where he talks about um, the knowledge that the average person has, the way that not everybody has done the political science degree that he's done. But also just the fact that, like, you know, most people go to work, they spend eight hours a day at work, they spend immense amounts of time stuck in cars, travelling across this ludicrously large country that you guys live in. Um, and an awful lot of time making sure that, you know, um, their kids don't fight with the dock. Like, people don't have the time to go into this ridiculous analytical depth of all of these little individual facts. Um, people don't have a meaningful way to distinguish which of this torrent of facts in his information-dense world are really the important ones. And this means that people are overwhelmed. And people lack expertise. And this means two things. So either individuals are going to choose to try and interpret all of this vast amount of information themselves to form opinions and actions based upon it. Um, we say because of the amount of information, because they don't have a meaningful way to filter it, because they don't have much time, they don't have much expertise, they're going to fuck up. You're all going to fuck up. And that means you're going to be, have even more ill-informed opinions than you would in a world in which you just listened to Fox News exclusively, right? Because at least Fox News, the people on there, might be ideologues, but they are, I, they are ideologues with expertise, right? They have an understanding of the issues, even if they take a particular position on the issues, an understanding that most individuals do not have. When it, like... And insofar as some people think they do, that's even worse. Because the in-group that you have, the political discussion group, the way in which you form opinions, is no longer one informed by the rules of sort of like constraining even a 
politically diverse media, but it becomes your friendship group, or it becomes the online forums in which you frequent, right? If a choice is between 4chan or Fox News, I know which one of those things I would choose as the future of media, right? What we say is a world of purely neutral media is a world of confusion, a world in which it is much more difficult for individuals to become informed, to decide their opinions, and it becomes much more difficult for particular issues, things like this election, to become the issue you dedicate your time to, the thing that is important, the thing that you decide, this is the one where I put my effort in, this is the one where I understand. Because every single day you are faced with a torrent of information. And most people won't even try. Most people will give up in the face of an expectation to keep up with every single little detail of the world when you're expected to be always on for every second of a day. We say, no, this is not the world we want. What do we want? A world of political diversity, right? A world in which media represents different positions from across the political spectrum. Because while I don't know about the situation, the military situation um, in Iraq and Syria in vast and great detail, what I do know is I'm a leftist. And it's legitimate for me to say, you know what? I am going to outsource the detailed thinking of this policy to people who I know share the broad values that I have. People who I know share those values and have expertise that I don't have, right? That I can choose to use the same metrics as the ideal version of me would in judging the information that's out there in the world, right? It's entirely legitimate to say, I will turn on MSNBC or I will turn on Fox News because I trust this person to make the same kind of judgment I, at my best, would make in evaluating that information. And that means I don't become overwhelmed. It means that I can engage with that media because I have a filter that allows me to focus on the things that I think are most important in the world. And it means when it comes to the election, when it comes to something huge, because I'm not overwhelmed, because I filtered out most of the unimportant stuff, I can sit there and I can dedicate my time, what little time I have, to this one truly important thing. And then I can do my research, and I can make that comparison, and I can swap between different ideas from this place or that place. And it's incredibly important, because not only does it mean that I have a better understanding of issues, that more people engage with media, but it means that when I look at the media, I'm I get also a view of what other people believe. I see that both Fox News and MSNBC exist. I see that there is a diversity of approaches to different issues. And this is incredibly important because one of the flaws of this election has been the way in which um, people have been trapped in their own bubbles, have not seen that Trump was coming because they only ever talked to people who were like them. And therefore, they didn't see how that choice could ever be made and were incredibly surprised by it. But when you have a world of political diversity where you're forced to confront these differences of opinions, that's when you learn these lessons better than you do in a world of ignorance and bubbles on David's side of the debate. Very proud to oppose. <laughs> Okay, we are going to go ahead and do the Q&A session now. Um, so you will all have 10 minutes to do this. We will have a microphone being passed around. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand and someone will bring the microphone to you, okay? So I have two questions. Uh, David, for you, the question is, um, you know, can there truly be independent public media? Sorry. Can there truly be independent public media, right, like the BBC or PBS? I mean, is that, do you, you see that as truly independent or are some, I mean, I think others would argue that, you know, those are, because those are to a degree state controlled, they also have a degree of bias. Oh. Is this on? I don't know. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll just talk about it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I don't think it's possible to ever have a completely 
unbiased source of media, I think David Wright would call me out on that. Uh, I, I did try and clarify that at the start. But what I think it can do is you can change the government structure at the top, saying, are you allowed to have a political ideology that governs this, or should your only ideology be one of spreading facts over emerging facts with opinion statements? And Jamie, for you, you, you said uh, that you know you sh that uh, she was trying to trying to follow the argument about opinion. But one of the issues that I see in American media, not just American media, is that people are dressing up. Uh, they they dress up the facts to meet the opinion. Does that make sense? So you're you're saying you know that. that so, 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 it's, so it's, it's almost like a bait and switch. It's like you present it as fact, but it's really opinion. But you're not. But those media outlets are not being baldly. Um, honest about the fact that those are opinions that are where, where, where facts are being twisted. And that, that's across the left and the right of American media. So I think it's the case that even in a media system where you have a diversity of political ideologies behind your views, it's still possible to have a framework where you call people out for things like libel uh, or like um, outright sort of lies about the situation in the world. But ultimately, when you're looking at media as a whole, I don't think you can draw a fine line between statements of value and statements of fact. Even when you decide which um, information to present first as headline news gives a different value to that piece of information that says this is important in the world. I don't think you can ever clearly distinguish and I think you have to embrace that. You mentioned that nobody in America saw Trump coming, but we have that separate news networks with Fox and MSNBC, and we don't have that one source. So how does that back up your argument? So, oh, that's a lot louder than I expected. Um, so the point that I'm making is not that the American system is perfect. It's not that um, having a plurality of media solves every issue with disagreements or bubbles. It's that it would be a lot worse if you didn't have that diversity, if you hid the fact that some people take very, very different approaches to what's important in the world or how to weigh up the good and the bad in the world. And if you only had pure facts, the only opinions that would be visible to you would be the opinions of your friends and family who are usually very much like yours. This is, this is a question for both of you. Given the advances in technology today, how would you feel about a system in which there was one unified source of fact in terms of what has occurred, actual facts, and that, were, that was probably indexed? I'm talking about Wikipedia times 2000 or something. Um, and then, in addition to that, there were news sources that were basically all columnists. So in other words, if you were a research reporter and you just said, nobody's written about this particular subject area, let me look into this, and you did a lot of research and you put that in the online index of fact, and then that became fodder for columnists of either of both sides to then cast opinion about your facts, pulling other uh, information out of the fact index to support their uh, view, kind of like what you guys are doing right now. Yeah, can I take that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I just think that's genuinely unworkable because in so many situations it's incredibly important that you have information quickly. When things are changing um, so rapidly on the ground, um, if you're looking at an unfolding crisis or something, you don't have the time to have that Wikipedia times a gabillion level of vetting. Um, and it's also the case that I think investigative journalism is incredibly, incredibly important. And if you had some central database of fact, um, like 
it's, it's, it's incredibly worrisome the, p the potential for politicisation of that institution as to what gets in there and who is always not allowed to be a legitimate source uh, because they're leaking something. For a very long while it was fact that um, Americans were not wiretapped, um, but that's not true. Sorry to ask, this, so I'm going to ask all the questions here, but um, I'm struck by the ProPublica model. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. So essentially the news, the, the news industry, most people argue, is broken. I mean, essentially the you know, companies are not making a lot of money. There are a lot of journalistic enterprises that are going out of business. They're cutting, um, they're cutting staff. And so, you know, one of the solutions, and I think this argues more to David's point than to your point, Jamie, is that, that the news business should be turned into a nonprofit enterprise, right, which is supported by people in the public or, um, or potentially by governments if there was some kind of wall between the funding and the journalism so that you could, get, you could then get a sort of non-corporate influenced independent media out there um, because, sort of to speak to your point, you know, because uh, you know, these news organizations are trying to create an audience for the purpose of profit, they are, they have an investment in sensationalizing pretty much everything. Um, and, and, and sort of, as I said earlier, sort of dressing up fact as a shrill opinion. Um, and I think I found it particularly frustrating during this election cycle to feel like it was really hard to identify an independent news source to, to be able to follow the election. Yeah, I think there's a, there are various ways in which you can end up with a diversity of different perspectives. And I think it might be more like, it might be better if you had a diversity of different nonprofits with different ideologies with, based on like who was in their newsroom than um, people chasing profits. But I think either of these is better than David's Leviathan news organization. Oh, I got a chance to res I got a chance to respond for once. <laughs> I know. You said a lot of bullshit that I had to call out. Uh, I, th I think it's yeah. I think there is definitely a danger. I've got to be honest. I'm not going to bullshit here. I think there is a danger that any form of one state-owned organisation has a tendency to support that state op uh, operations, even when it's not valid. But I, I think that's always going to be a danger. I just think that that is a potential danger, rather than the actual danger of allowing a plurality of news sources to come from wherever they want. And there's a massive incentive for people who are involved in you know, big business, in terms of Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post, or the buyout of a lot of corporate newspapers by big conglomerates to sell a particular news story and a version of events that will only ever benefit them. Jamie's main case relies around the fact that we will all discuss things and we'll all look at multiple news sources and you can come to almost like a balanced opinion. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think people buy into one particular ideology, one particular news source. And then when you come together to talk about it, that creates a hell of a lot of fighting and bias. I mean, you just have to look at the way people interacted with facts around the Trump and Hillary case. That meant that there wasn't like a comp combination a synthesis that came out of that. It was two very, very disparate groups. And Jamie's entire case where he gets up there and says, oh, but it's useful for making people protest. Imagine if the election had been a couple of thousand votes the other way, and the people that were protesting are the ones with the Confederate flags. Not all forms of protest are good. In fact, a lot of them aren't. And a lot of them don't serve anything and just promote violence. We have time for one more question. This is a statement aimed at the both of you. A huge part of media isn't just who is giving away the information, but also who is in support of it. The media has been a huge part of um, just this entire election, all of the bias that you can handle, and even with this election, many YouTube stars, many celebrities have been in focus as to what side should be promoted and what side should be demoted. In the case of media bias and media neutrality, do you think that social media and even high celebrities and focused people should also be neutralized or 
support it in their statements? Um, I think, I'm, I'm not, not entirely sure I understand your question, um, but I think one of the problems that you have with a model in which your mainstream media, your dominant mass media, is purely fact-based, is that all of these um, unregulatable internet sources become the way in which people um, start to acquire their opinions, right, their evaluation of these facts. And you can pass your, anybody can pass themselves off as an ex expert um, online, whereas at least um, in a news source, even if it's a bias or it has an ideology, the people who get to be in a news corporation have degrees in the subject that they're talking about. Even if they're ideologues, they're still experts rather than um, the internet where nobody knows if I am in fact a kitten. No, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your questions. Look, David says that what this debate is about is about facts. He says that my case is a case about synthesizing and competition. It's not. Sit down and shut up. You're talking nonsense. What I say is, look, it's fine if a person sticks to one new source. It's fine if a person sticks to one ideologue of the mainstream media. It's fine because the alternative is worse. It's fine because as an individual, I'm likely either to drop out of being informed at all in a world in which all I am faced with is a torrent of incomprehensible fact upon fact upon fact, and I have no filtering mechanism. I have no time to do that evaluation for myself. I think where I am able to pick an ideologue and go, this ideologue, he sounds like me when I'm at my smartest, I'll listen to him, is in fact a good choice to make and a legitimate choice to make, right? I think it's okay to sit there and go, I don't have the expertise. But I can find people who do have the expertise and who think like me, who value things that I value, who have the same political perspective that I do, and to listen to them. Because I'm always going to draw opinions. I'm always going to um, vote or write or have discussions. And it's vastly better in a world in which I'm informed by these individuals, or I have that mechanism, than a world in which I either don't listen to the news, I don't know what's going on, and I, I, I'm talking shit like we do in this debate. And it's vastly better than the world where instead I try and do my independent research, where I, where I assume that actually I know everything. I've listened to the news, the one news, the big news, and I can pick it apart and find out what's important. Precisely because I don't have that knowledge. Um, precisely because I don't have the time to dedicate um, to unpicking the details of what those facts really mean for my daily life. And if I do discuss things in a world in which I've attempted to do that, or in a world in which I have limited sort of knowledge of politics at all, the people I discuss that with are the people who are closest to my position already, right? That seals me in a bubble where a, where a factual error or a particular opinion just becomes an echo chamber, right? In a world in which you have a media out there which you are willing to engage with, but you are capable of engaging with, that's when those sorts of things are most likely to be challenged, even in, within the confines of particular ideologies. But what's more is that you usually aren't, in fact, confined as much as David says that you are, right? It is a case that, like, um, people who watch MSNBC also watch CNN, right? There is a diversity of media establishments that are available to watch, but even if you don't actually watch them, even if you sit there and go, you know what, I'm just going to watch the guy I've decided is right, you are still aware that these other sources are out there. You are still have your stereotype of the MSNBC or the Fox News reporter, right? You still have this image in your head of other individuals who think differently 
from you, right? You still have an awareness of the breadth of political space that exists, right? That's precisely what I was talking about during that question earlier um, about the election and a world in which you're aware of the breadth of politics is a world in which you're much you're forced to confront the fact that people disagree with you and therefore you need to sit down to seek out you're prompted to seek out other sources because you have to understand why it is that people disagree with you rather than talking purely to those people that already do third thing in this debate um, so it's also impossible to have the world that David wants. It's impossible because it's impossible to be truly neutral. Not just in the sense of like, you know, Russia today is the Russian state media and is biased as all hell towards Russia. But it's also the case that simply in presenting facts you still make judgments of evaluation. The story I like to tell is a story of two monks, right? Two monks at a monastery. Um, so one of these monks goes to his pastor and he says, Oh, pastor, um, am I allowed to smoke while I pray? And the pastor says, no, no, how dare you? You're desecrating this sacred activity with this incredibly, this awful, this, this dirty habit. You, 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 you don't do that. That's not part of our covenant. There's another monk that goes to the pastor and says, pastor, pastor, um, is it okay if I pray while I smoke? Of course it is, my son. Like, praying is an activity for, for all time, for whatever you're doing. Um, that is, it's a good and holy activity, but it's good whenever you do it. The framing of that discussion, what comes first or what comes last, changed how you understood the facts. Because what, what the individual, what the monk was doing in either situation was exactly the same. But the way in which you present those true facts changes the way in which you understand that situation. And that's precisely why, even in a world in which you tell simply facts, you can't avoid implying positions. You can't avoid bias, right? So we say that his world can't exist, and if you try and create that world, what you instead of end up in is a world of a dead end where political discussion ceases to happen, people become less informed, less engaged with media, and therefore less capable of taking any political action at all. We think that's essential for a working democracy. Um, to sum up, this is not a debate about facts. This is not about who gets the best facts or whether or not you get facts. It is a debate about how do you turn facts into individuals' action in the world. How do you make individuals become willing to act in the world? How do you make, how do you make and form opinions and how do you make the media useful? The media on his side tells you lots and lots of facts, but it is a useless media. The media on our side might have biases, but it's media that people listen to media that people use, and that's why this side is the correct side of the debate. Very proud to oppose. Jamie just concentrated a lot of his summary speech on this idea that you can't have an unbiased news media. And true, we agree. If he'd listened to my speech, I started off by saying that you can't have an unbiased news media source. But what you can do is you can set up a primary news organisation that has the overriding ideology of promoting unbiased information. Jamie wants me to defend Russia and Russian news. I don't have to do that. That's not how debate works. What I can do is defend a system in which there is a constitutional change which sets up a lockbox for funding which is completely separate to any form of political ideology and funds an independent news media. We recognise there will be bias in terms of choice of facts that is used, but we think that when your overriding ideology is one of which you're promoting balance and promoting what they think the, uh, the truth is, 
that is far better than what we have or what Jane is defending. Because Jane was quite happy to get up here and defend Fox News. He was quite happy to get up here and defend MSNBC. This polarized ideology where individuals are allowed to buy out particular sections of the public and say that this is the ideology that you will ascribe to when you are telling your story, when you are painting the picture of the fact. The alternative is a polarized news media in which Jeff Bezos is able to buy out the Washington Post and then suppress all news stories about his treatment of people who work at Amazon. And we think, whilst our system isn't perfect, his system is even less perfect and less information comes out and less facts are talked about. No, you don't get points in summaries. So then his response is, then we get onto the first real response, this idea that a plurality of media sources call each other out, that MSNBC calls out Fox, and that means that Fox behaves without lying. And also how we call bullshit on that. We don't really think that Fox cares what MSNBC says about it, because if it did, it would notice that MSNBC has been criticizing Fox quite a lot. And it would notice that, and it would probably change its behavior. But individuals who are on that side of the information, uh, are on that side, and listen to Fox as their primary news source, are shown to be much less aware of the facts that are behind, say, the Iraq war case. Only over 70% of people who watched Fox News believed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. That's not something that's brought about, that's not something that changed the messaging of Fox when MSNBC called them out on it. It's also not something that is solved by Jamie's plan of, oh, but the multitude of people watch a majority of news sources and take, you know, views from every little bit. Because we say, firstly, that's just factually untrue. Your identity is almost defined by the media source you listen to. You are a Fox News house. You are a MSNBC house. I mean, the big thing that we can talk about here in the recent, uh, recent days is the way that the news media shaped the last 30 days of the election campaign. In that Hillary's emails were talked about three times as much as her policy booklet. We think that with an unbiased or a state-controlled, if you will, media source, they would have recognized that the emails probably aren't as important as the policy documents that she has produced and that Trump failed to produce. We think that the controlling of a particular narrative is very easy to do when you have a plurality of views and you, your site only ever talks about it. So then the second part is that Jamie's case relies on a plurality of people... Oh, sorry. A multitude of people watching a multitude of media sources. And we say that that's such wrong. What happens is you tend to identify with the media source you choose. You tend to pick the source that best represents your opinion and disregard anything from the other side of the political spectrum as being biased and unhelpful. And then you start calling them out on it. You start saying things like Trump says of the biased media institution. You start saying things like everyone is lying except me. Jamie wants us to believe it's fine to stick to one news source, but when that news source has an ideology attached to it, it's never going to portray anything that's not attached to that ideology. So what's the main underlying problem of this? Because we don't think in a, in a vacuum that that's particularly problematic. Is that the main problem is you can't resolve differences between people. So Jamie says that protest is good, but protest isn't good when you don't have the same overlying structure of facts or same belief in reality, because you can't ever resolve anything, because your conception of how everything is is so vastly different to anyone else that the only thing you can do when you engage with your supporters is attack them. You attack them on personality and ad hominem attacks, which is what we saw in the last presidential election campaign. If you can't agree what reality looks like, you can't work out what the next step forward is. And we say that when you have one centralized news source, that reality is much easier to be believed and to be understood. And we think this is much more important, and then Jamie drops this point, because media often has an uh, an incentive to sensationalize. In order to sell its viewpoint, it has to sell the worst of its viewpoint. It has to sell the most extreme of its viewpoint. And it has to promote the far ends of it, because that is what people look for, and that's what people buy into. We think that when you have a central viewpoint, it may not necessarily cover all of the egregious excesses of both sides, but also it promotes a balanced view and allows people to buy in. 
So Jamie's main point then is people don't have time to interpret news and facts. And that it's okay and it's good that we outsource our opinion making to other people and allow others to tell me what to feel. So if you're on turn to the left, you buy into your socialist news sources. And if you're on the right, you buy into Breitbart's perspective of the world because they have experts and it's okay to buy what those experts believe. Our case wasn't that. Our case was that most people can interpret most facts, and that if I say 99% of scientists believe in global climate change, that is a fact, but also promotes a particular idea that is allowed to be discussed. More importantly, at no point did we say you cannot have debate, but you can't do what MSNBC do and what Fox do, is which take people only debating from one side of the viewpoint. So you will have five conservative pundits to your one liberal pundit. We say you can't have that, and that is what we are getting rid of. So the alternative Jamie supports is this idea of experts and experts being good. But what we say is these experts are chosen to fit their particular ideology. We say in terms of the climate change example, Fox only chooses experts which are climate deniers. And that when you are presented with two different competing views of reality, that is the part where individuals have problems in deciding which is which. Because without doing a PhD in global climate change, it is not possible to notice which of these two realities competing is factually accurate. But what we say is when you have a centralized news source, you can still have those experts, and you can then come up with the actual synthesized answer. So why does Jamie say this, this is important? He says it's important because information isn't good in itself, but it's used in forms of politics and elections, and it's needed, and he said this word for word, it's needed to facilitate protest, as if protest in itself is a good we say that not all protest is good. In fact, we say that had the election gone slightly differently, there could be crowds of racists standing outside polling stations in ethnic minority areas at the moment with guns, protesting the result. We don't think that form of protest is good. More importantly, we say most forms of protest aren't good because they don't promote a synthesis of ideas. They don't promote coming to a conclusion, a resolution. Especially in a scenario in which you cannot agree on the facts that you are arguing about, you're never going to have a situation where things get better. You're just going to get a more and more polarized society. And the more and more it polarizes, the more and more that damages the lives of every individual that's involved, because you can never get anything done. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to propose this motion. Thank you, James and David. <clears throat> if you all would please stand um, if you think David won the day, arguing that the news media should remain neutral. Thank you, you may be seated. And if you think James was more persuasive, please stand. Didn't count, but <laughs> I think David may have won that. Um, either way, thank you both so much for being here. And this concludes our event.